بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على حبي المصطفى وعلى آله وأصحابه وعلى من اتبع الهدى أما بعد رب شرح لي صدري ويسل لي أمري وحل أخذ من لساني فهم قولي سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك ذا العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا بما ينفعنا وأنفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما آمين يا رب العالمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Dear participants, students, viewers, and friend, friends, well, first of all, Jazakumallahu khair for Al Balag Academy, uh, to Al Balag Academy for giving me this opportunity to deliver a webinar on the fiqh of animal sacrificing, which means Al Udhiyah and Eid al Adha. Now, although the title is uh, Eid al Adha, but just as a slight correction, that uh, we'll be specifically focusing on animal sacrifice. We'll be discussing specifically on animal sacrifice. And we'll have other speakers that will be discussing uh, on the performance of Eid al-Salah, insha'Allah. So let us begin. Uh, so the overview, uh, we'll be discussing, number one, uh, the virtues of uh, Qurbani. Number two, the legal rulings uh, regarding uh, Udhiya and Qurbani. Number three is days and timings. Number four, sacri uh, sacrificial animals. And then number five, the recipients. And then we will begin. Uh, with uh, f uh, frequently asked questions, question answers. So the first part, so this will just will be just a general overview of the essential uh, of the essential rulings, the core rulings, the fundamental rulings of Qurbani. And the second part to the discussion will be just addressing frequently asked questions. And if time does permit, if any of the participants have any questions, you can just insert your question in the chat box. I'll be happy to discuss the, discuss them at the end. So just as a disclaimer here, though. Uh, please in, uh, input your uh, input your questions. Uh, please input your question into the chat box, and I will address them in the end. Inshallah, I will address them at the end. I will not address them during the uh, during the uh, during the lecture. So, now the essentials. So first of all, let's look at the essentials, the virtues. So the virtues of Qurbani. Number one, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala states in the Quran, "Wasalli li Rabbika wa nhar." This is with al kawthar Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, so offer salah to your uh, so offer salah uh, for your Lord when har and sacrifice. So here many of the ulama have mentioned, such as in the Kathir and various other uh, Mufassirun, they said that when har here is referring to Qurbani is sacrificing. So we have an indication in the Quran of Qurbani. Number two, Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu anhu relates and the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Ma min amalin. ما 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 عمل آدمي من عمل يوم يوم النوم يوم النحر أحب إلى الله من إهراق الدم إنها لتأتي يوم القيامة بقرورها وأشعارها وأظلافها وإن الدم لا يقع من الله بمكان قبل أن يقع من الأرض فطيبوا بها نفسا. So this is a Sahih Hadith. This is a Hadith in Sunan Al-Tirmizi. Sayyid Aisha رضي الله عنه reports that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said that there is no Action. There is no action uh, that uh, a person, admi, a person does on the day of on the day of Nahar, which is on the day of Qurbani, which is more beloved to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala than sh than shedding blood, than spilling the blood. This blood here is referring to sacrificing the animal, and then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi continued because the sacrificial animal it will appear on the day of, on the day of judgment with his horns, with his hair, with his hooves, and indeed the blood will be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, where it is received before it even falls onto the land, before it falls onto the earth, so let your heart be delighted in it, so let your heart be delighted in it. So what this hadith is saying is that when a person sacrifices an animal, sacrifices an animal, then on the day of judgment, then this animal will come with it sacrifice uh, this animal will come with all of his bodily parts and these bodily parts will be placed on a person's uh, on the person's uh, uh, right uh, the right scale the right pan of the balance so when a person's good deeds are going to when they when the person's deeds are going to be uh, weighed on the right as well as onto the left then the right side will weigh all of the good deeds the left side will weigh all the all of the bad deeds are the evil deeds so your sacrificial animals will be weighed on the right side in a uh, right side on your good deeds so this will be part of your good deeds everything and that's what the prophet sallallahu alaihi is saying and this is the one of the most beloved acts in the eyes of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and before the blood even reaches 
the, before the blood even reaches onto the ground, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then already had accepts it. So therefore, let your heart be delighted. You know, those be, be delighted and take and be and glad tidings for any person that who sheds blood on this particular day. So that's the first hadith. The second hadith is Sayyid ibn Arqam radiallahu reports. All Ashab Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, many of the companions of the Prophet would say, Ya Rasulullah, they, they, they asked, Ya Rasulullah, ma hadhi al adahi so what is this Qurbani? Now, what is the philosophy of Qurbani? So the first one was discussing the um, discussing the reward. But what is the philosophy of Qurbani? Why do we perform Qurbani? The companions of the Prophet Sallallahu they had already asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they inquired from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that what is Adahi? Tell us what is Adahi. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Sunnah to Abikum Ibrahim. This is the Sunnah of your father, Ibrahim Alayhi Salatu Salam. Now, I just want to pause here and just mention something, mention um, a crucial point here. That there is um, there is an understanding, there is a notion amongst people that qurbani, anim, qurbani is performed for the poor people. We sacrifice animal for the poor people. This is partially untrue. Partially untrue. That is partially true in a sense that where when we sacrifice an animal, we allocate a certain portion for the poor people, although it is not necessary. But it's partially untrue is because Qurbani itself is not for the poor people. It's not like Zakat, for example. Zakat is specifically for the poor people, right? And you have, and the Sadaqat al-Wajiba, or those Sadaqats and those charities which are, waj, which are wajib, they are for the poor people, right? Charity generally, predominantly, is given to the poor people, to the poor and the needy people. But Qurbani is not like that. Qurbani, it's not necessarily wholly like a charity. It is an ibadat. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not say that we do Qurbani for the sake of charity for the poor people. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that we sacrifice an animal to follow the sunnah of your forefather Ibrahim Alayhi Salatu Salam. And we all know the story, right? We all know the story. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala relates the account in the Quran when the Prophet Sallallahu, when Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also explained uh, uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also explained that when Ibrahim Alayhi Salatu Salam when he dreamt that he was sacrificing his own son which was Ismail alayhi salatu salam. And dreams is a form of wahi, it's a form of revelation, uh, it's a form of inspiration, for a divine inspiration from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam, after seeing this dream, he related this dream to his son Ismail. Ismail, he submitted to, the, uh, to, uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's instructions and both father and son made their way to a particular mountain and when Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam was about to sacrifice his own son and he placed the, he placed the, uh, the knife uh, near his neck, near his neck, ready to sacrifice his own son, Jibreel alayhi salatu salam instantly appeared and prevented Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam from sacrificing his own son and gave him the glad tidings that he has passed his test. Gave him the glad tidings that he has passed his test. So do not sacrifice your son. Or rather sacrifice this ram. Jibreel alayhi salatu salam came with a ram. And that ram was from Jannah. There's a lot of speculation. There's a lot of theories behind where is this, uh, the origin of this ram. We don't want to go into the details of that. We leave it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But nevertheless, that this ram was from paradise, was from Jannah. And, uh, Ibra and Jibreel alayhi salatu salam placed this, in front of, uh, uh, placed this ram in front of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And commanded him to sacrifice this. Now, because this was such a great sacrifice, this was a sacred act in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then commanded the ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that you also sacrifice, like sacrifice an animal like your forefather Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam did, and is to commemorate that we sacrifice all our beloveds for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Metaphorically speaking, obviously. So, Sunnah to Abikum Ibrahim is Qurbani is to follow the Sunnah of your forefather Ibrahim. And then they say, Qalu, fama lana fiha ya Rasulullah. That what is there in it for us? What is there in it for us, O Messenger of Allah? Meaning, if we sacrifice an animal to follow Ibrahim, that what share do we have in this? So, look at the companions. Look at the companions they're asking. That they're asking not just the philosophy, but they're also asking that. How does this impact us? Which means, what do we get from this? So then the Prophet said, For every fiber of hair that you will receive a hasana, you will receive one reward, a naki, a good deed. What about the wool? The Prophet said, For every fiber of hair 
of the wall will equal um you will receive one reward so in other words like you know for every fiber of hair that is on a sheep's wool you will get an equal reward of that so can you just imagine they know the number of the fiber of hair on the wool on the wool of an uh, of a sheep or the each fiber of hair on a goat's animal or even a cow's uh, uh, even a goat on a goat's body or a sheep's body or for or on the body of a cow or all the other sacrificial animals if you sacrifice them then each and every of that hair on the animal's body you will receive a reward and not only that its bodily limbs its bodily parts will come on the day of judgment and will be placed in the right in the right side of the pan of the balance where you, with your good deeds so this is an encouragement that we should sacrifice uh, we should sacrifice on this particular day now the second part is legal rulings on whom is uh, on who um, on whom is a wajib who is a wajib upon so wajib obviously means mandatory it is not a farad the reason why we do not say is a farad is because that this is not something that's part of the uh, main, main arkans main arkans like the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned about the five pillars of the deen but because the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam continuously performed this and sayyidina abdullah bin umar radiyallahu reports that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam remained in medina for 10 years and every single year the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam performed qurbani and the fact that because the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam performed qurbani every single year this is, which is why the hanafi madhab they rule that it is wajib now it is wajib mandatory upon every muslim but there are certain conditions but there are certain conditions you know for qurbani to become wajib number one is you have to be sound minded and aqil so this is what sound mind basically means it's not like a loose term they say but somebody has to be sound uh, sound minded or so but it refers to someone has um someone whose intellectual capacity intellectual capacity is intact their intellectual capacity their rationality their sanity is not inhibited it is intact so in other words they're not insane for example number 2 they are mature this is referring to baligh someone who's baligh okay so therefore a child who's not baligh or baligh is compulsory upon them number 3 resident in other words not mature and a traveler you have to be a resident so in other words you're a muqim for example if you are a musafir if you fulfill the criteria of a shar'i musafir then qurbani is not compulsory upon uh, the individual and number 4 wealthy you have to be wealthy what does that mean you have to possess possesses zakatul nisab so in other words, the nisab rate, the minimum nisab rate for qurbani to be compulsory and necessary is equivalent to the nisab of zakat. Now, I just checked this uh, yesterday that the current nisab of zakat is about, in pounds, it's about 453 pounds, around about, between about, between 100, 150 to, between 450 to 453 pounds, okay? This will be go according to the silver nisab, okay? So the silver nisab is 612.36 grams, yes? Because that's how we determine zakat, okay? The value of 612.36 grams of silver. So the equivalent of that today in cash is between 450 to 453, uh, 453 uh, gr um, uh, grams. And this uh this um this threshold can by the way just vary okay so today obviously it's now the um it's not the 15th it's the 15th of um june 2024 so that is the current that's the current market value of course tomorrow the day after uh next week next month next year or the years to come for example this um this will vary so it is advisable just make this time it is advisable that you will have to check from your local jewelers that what is the current nisab rate so the way you ask is so the way to determine is that 612.36 grams of silver what is the current uh, what is the current value of that in cash of that particular time then wherever the nisab is wherever the answer is then that will be the nisab of zakat as well as the nisab for sadaqat al-fitr as well as qurbani okay so just to make that make you all aware of that so possesses zakat al nisab b um access uh, access to of one's basic needs so in other words that wherever you have Okay, any possessions that you have, whether it be monetary or non-monetary, whether it be assets or non-assets. Okay, if they, if you have additional assets, additional assets which are beyond your needs, additional assets beyond your need, which which means is that you can survive without them. They're just for extra comfort, for example. They're just like luxury, for example, or they just luxury or the surplus to your needs. Okay, and the value of that is equivalent to the zakatable nisab. So to make it easier, is equal or more 
to the value of 450 pounds, for example, in pounds, okay, right? It's equal or more to 450 pounds, then, then Qurbani becomes necessary. And number three, possession of one lunar year is not necessary. Now, this is a key thing to remember here. There are two key differences I've just indicated to uh, be, uh, between Qurbani and Zakat. In Zakat, number one is that Zakat is compulsory upon those assets where there's productivity, which is cash, gold, silver, or trading stocks. Yes, that's one difference. Qurbani, and likewise Fitrana. Qurbani and Fitrana rules are exactly the same. Qurbani and Fitrana, on the other hand, the assets, they don't need to be productive. So even if, let's say, for example, if you have like, I'll just give a random example, let's say, you have about three cars. Three cars, okay, right? Each one is worth about a thousand pounds or two thousand dollars, for example. One is essential, the other two are just extra comfort, for example, okay, right? Which means that you don't necessarily require two other cars, but that's just for extra luxury, for example, okay? Now, and they're just for your own use, you're not trading them. So you've got three cars, two are spare, one is essential, and each one is about a thousand pounds or more or two thousand dollars, etc. So, could, so zakat will not be compulsory upon you. Zakat is not compulsory because zakat is not uh, compulsory on uh, non-productive wealth, okay? Because it has to be for trading. You don't use it for trading. However, qurbani and fitrana will become necessary. Qurbani and qurbani will be necessary. So number one is, they don't have to be assets of productivity as long as they are beyond the ascension of one. And number two, another difference between zakat and qurbani is that just as zakat, one lunar year has pa must pass. Okay, one lunar year must pass in order for the for that um, for that um, for that wealth or for that asset to be zakatable. In the case of Qurbani, on the other hand, one lunar year does not need to pass. In the case of Fitrana, likewise, the lunar year does not need to pass, but it's rather on that particular day. So the Qurbani days, as we will discuss, is between 10, 11, and 12, is three days, Qurbani, three days Qurbani. It could be any of those days that you attain. Uh, that you fulfill this uh, fulfill this condition, right? So the one lunar year does not need to pass. It's just those three days. Uh, just one one point to highlight though regarding this is that the scholars have mentioned and the Hanafi scholars have mentioned that because Qurbani is three days, the Qurbani is three days, 10, 11, and 12, then it's usually the last day, the last day of Qurbanis, uh, a person's, is usually during the last day, uh, on the 12th, of, 12th day, is a person's financial state finally considered. Financial state is taken into consideration. Yes? So I'll give you a typical example. Let's say a person uh, on the first day, on the 10th of Zulhijjah, they were wealthy. Okay? They were wealthy. But all of a sudden, God forbid, their entire wealth got stolen on the same day. Yes? And now because of that, on the 11th and the 12th, they are now poor. Is Qurbani compulsory upon them? No, it isn't. Qurbani is not necessary. It is dropped. Yes? Let's look at the opposite now. Let's say, for example, on the 10th, somebody was poor. On the 11th, they were also poor. On the 12th, miraculously, for example, somebody came and gifted them with thousands and thousands of pounds. They became rich now. They became rich overnight, for example. They became rich on the day of the 12th, for example. Okay, right? So now, because the Qurban, the rules of financial, uh, of a person's financial condition is determined by the last day on the 12th day, so if a person became rich just only on the 12th, now Qurbani becomes wajib upon them. Yes, they have to purchase an animal and they have to now sacrifice it. If not, for example, if they did not do it, then that wajib still remains on them. What they must do now, they must give that amount, equivalent amount to sadaqah, uh, sadaqah for the poor and the needy. Okay, which I will discuss shortly as well. That is a question that we're going to be discussing that can someone replace Qurbani with the... Um, uh, with charity money instead, okay, right? So we'll talk about that. But just for now to understand, Qurbani is necessary. And if the days of Qurbani have passed, Qurbani is wajib, upon, uh, wajib on a person and they never performed it, then what they must do now is they need to pay in charity the value of a Qurbani animal, a share or an, uh, a share of an animal or, or, or a full animal, depending on whichever whichever one they choose. So, that, so just to keep those um, essential points in mind. So let's continue. Now, next is what are the days of Udhiyah? What are the days of Udhiyah? So as I just mentioned, that there are three days. There are 10th, 11th, and 12th. So you, could do, so you can sacrifice an animal during any of these three days, as long as it is after Eid Salah. So this is something that uh, will, be, will, will be mentioned, but I will just mention it now, is that Qurbani animal, okay, so, uh, so Qurbani must take place after Eid Salah. You cannot perform Qurbani before Eid Salah. 
There is a Sahih Hadith that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that whosoever was to perform Qurbani before Eid Salah, if he performed Qurbani before Eid Salah, then he should repeat the Qurbani. He should repeat the Qurbani. Yes? So it's on the 10th, 11th or 12th after a person's Eid Salah. So once you perform your Eid Salah, that's when the Wujub or Qurbani begins. And another masala to remember, and I will indicate to this later on, is that it is the location of the Qurbani animal that's taken into consideration. A lot of people nowadays, they send the Qurbani animal to a different country to, to be performed. Very few people, very rare, or very few people perform Qurbani locally. Also, for the, as for those that who send their Qurbani animal uh, to another uh, um, pay for the Qurbani to be taken place elsewhere, then it is the Qurbani animal's location that's taken into consideration, and it should be performed after they eat salah. We'll discuss that uh, in detail later on, inshallah. So in any case, so do remember, so the days of Qurbani are 10th, 11th, and 12th of Zulhijjah, and it begins after Eid salah. So the first day, it is more preferable the sec uh, than the second, then the second is better than the third, etc. So a person can perform Qurbani during any of these three days, but performing it straight away on the 10th is uh, preferable. Now, what is the place and time of Qurbani, Udhiyah? So the place where the actual sacrifice takes place is what is considered for the ruling rather than the location of a person upon whom Qurban is mandatory. So as I just indicated to this, right? I just indicated to this already. Is that Qurbani is, a comp uh, it is a location of the animal that's taken into consideration, not the individual themselves. So therefore, you have two kind of locations. One is town and city, and one is outside of town cities and those villages. Now the ruling is that Qurbani is necessary upon those who live in big towns and cities. So, for, for example, most of us now live in towns and cities, so therefore Qurbani is compulsory upon them. However, those who live in, however, those who live outside of towns and cities, so for example, they live in small villages, for example, and the villages such that way do, that does not fulfill the condition, the criteria of Eid Salah and Jumma Salah, okay? So then Qurbani is not wajib upon them. So just to be clear, that how do you distinguish from the Sharia point of view between a town and a village? Simple term is that in a place that a place or region that fulfills all of the conditions of Juma Salah and Eid Salah that falls into the condition that falls uh, that becomes a um, city that falls under the definition of a city and therefore um, uh, and therefore Eid Salah becomes wajib upon them. As for that which does not fulfill the conditions of Juma Salah, for example then neither Juma Salah will be necessary in there, neither Eid Salah will be necessary, neither Eid Salah will be compulsory in there. Yes, neither, neither Eid Salah will be compulsory therein. So you have towns and cities. So from so from after the Eid Salah until the sunset of 12th Zul Hijjah, that's the time of Qurbani. So it is performed, if performed before Eid Salah, then it needs to be repeated. As I mentioned, the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that anyone that who performs Qurbani before Eid Salah, then he should repeat the Qurbani. Outside of cities that does not fulfill the criteria of Jum'ah ah, will also not fulfill, uh, will uh, also um, also Qurb performing Eid Salah will not be necessary. So it'll be valid from after Fajr Salah uh, 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 of Eid of the first day of Eid. So the Qurbani time will begin after Fajr Salah. So as soon as you pray the Fajr Salah, Subah Sadiq, then uh, you can sacrifice. Then sacrificing the animal becomes wajib and necessary. Now. Legal rulings about the uh, what animals are permissible. So what kind of animals are permissible to sacrifice and what's not permissible to sacrifice? So sacrificing uh, um, so sacrifice an animal, you have sort of like two categories, broad categories. You have a small animal and you have a large animal. Small animal and a large animal. So small animal, it could be goat, sheep or ram. It could even include a ram. So goat, sheep or ram, it could be the male or female. And its minimal age must be one year of age. It has to be at least one year old. So if it's less than that, then you cannot sack it. Then that does not qualify for, uh, for Qurbani. So minimum is one year. The scholars, however, do mention that if the animal's size is such and it's so bulky and it's chubby, that if it, even though that if it's less than a year, but it seems like it is at least one year old, then that also becomes, uh, then sacrificing that animal is permissible. So for example, if there is an animal, um, a goat or a sheep or a ram, for instance, that they're about seven months uh, seven months old, but if it was released amongst the herd of uh, amongst the herd, if it was released within the herd, 
and you cannot tell the difference between whether it is one years old or less than one years old because due to its size, then sacrificing that animal would also be permissible. Number two, a large animal. So we talked about the small animal, now a large animal. Large animal includes a cow, bull, a buffalo, or a camel. Now the distinction, however, is, is that the cow, buff cow, bull, buffalo, or even an ox, okay, or even an ox, you could say, you can, your ox even falls into this category, it has minimum two years of age. You cannot sacrifice the animal less than two years of age. And as for a camel in of itself, then it has to be minimum five years of age. Minimum five years of age. Now, what you notice here, these figures, okay, what these figures, what these represent is that uh, how many people maximum can contribute into the share of the animal? How many people maximum can contribute as a share of qurbani in an animal? So when it comes to a small animal, only one person suffices. You can't have that animal cannot be shared between more than one people. So you, can, so you cannot have two, three, four, or five people um, contributing together in one small animal. It has to, it's only suffice for one individual. As for large animals, as for large animals, maximum seven. And there's a clear hadith about this from Sunan, reported in Sunan Abu Dawood, where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that maximum shares in a large animal is seven. So you can have seven people contributing into a large animal. And that's including a cow, buffalo, uh, bull, buffalo, or even ox, as well as a camel. Now, what animals are not permissible? So there are certain animals uh, that are not permissible, which means that they do not qualify for qurbani. So one is obviously, I just mentioned the obvious one, is not mentioned here, but a chicken, for example. So chicken, obviously that does not qualify as a, uh, that does not qualify as a, um, uh, for qurbani. Although I have heard that some people do uh, claiming that you can even sacrifice a chicken for qurbani, that is not true. Uh, that chicken will not be valid for uh, qurbani. Of course, you can sacrifice it because it's halal to eat, but for qurbani or for worship or for aqika or for anything, then it is, uh, that it will suffice. Now, the, what the, the animals that are not permissible, which means that these above animals that we just discussed here, when do they not become permissible uh, or when do they not qualify for qurbani? The simple rule to remember is that if it's defective, if the animal is defective to the point that where that one third or more of the defective part of the animal, uh, defective animal part of the animal, it's seen or is observed in this particular animal, then that will no longer qualify for qurbani, right? Likewise, other defects, for example, that where that uh, it is blind, for example, it's totally blind, for instance, or it's crippled, for example, or it's very weak, that it's not able to walk, etc. So in other words, the animal, either some of his bodily parts, some of his parts, or as a whole, is become defective, majority of the case. Or in the case of um, a certain part, a certain bodily part of the animal is defective, minimum one third of it or more, then that does not qualify that does not qualify for uh, udhiyah so let's look at some examples animals that are blind one eyed or has lost one third or more of his eyesight one third or more of his eyesight likewise when it comes to some of his limb for example is defective one third of one third of more animals that have lost one third of the ear or the tail it can also include like other bodily parts like leg for example right the animal which has no ear from its birth likewise an animal that whose horn has been broken off from the root. It's been uprooted, for example, a ram, for instance. An animal which has one leg uh, lame to the extent that it walks on three legs only and is unable to use the fourth leg. Yes, it's unable to use the fourth leg. For example, it doesn't even have a fourth leg, for example, okay? Its fourth leg has been cut off. Or, for example, the fourth leg is paralyzed, for instance. Yes? Then uh, that does not qualify for qurbani. Next, an animal so lean and thin it's emaciated that its bones have uh, have no marrow, okay? It has no marrow. Or it's so skinny and so emaciated that where you can actually see its bones and skeletons, then that does not qualify for qurbani. An animal so weak that it cannot walk to the place of the slaughtering on, uh, on its own. And likewise, an animal completely toothless or one, uh, or one that has lost most of its teeth. Again, one third, one third or more of its teeth, then that does not qualify for qurbani. So in short, in summary, the animal has to be intact um, physically, has to be physically healthy and completely intact for qurbani, uh, for it to qualify for uh, as a sacrificial animal. Now, what are the rulings of the meat and the skin? 
Now, once the animal has fulfilled all the conditions and now you sacrifice it, what is permissible, what is not permissible? Now, just as a fundamental principle to note is that because the Qurbani animal, Qurbani animal in of itself, it is a ibadat, it's a worship, it's a form of worship. So therefore, it cannot be used to generate any material gains. You cannot use it to generate any material profits. You can't generate profit from it, okay? For example, you can't buy and sell it. You can't sell it, for example. You can't sell the animal now. So once you purchase it for Qurbani and you've sacrificed it, you cannot sell any of the body parts now. Yes? But what we can do is you can take benefit from yourself. You can take benefit for yourself or you can give it to charity. Likewise, any of its parts, for example, if it has like... um. Uh, like his wool, for example, okay, right? The wool of an animal, okay, right? Then you cannot sell that, and you can't sell that wool. But rather, you can give it to charity, or you can use it for your own personal. You can use it for your own personal need. So permissible meat and skin given as a charity as a gift. You can gift it to somebody. You can give it as a charity. Number two, to consume the meat distributed uh, to others, wealthy or poor. You can consume it and you can distribute it to others. I have meant. I it has come to my attention that some people have said that we should give the whole animal to charity because the more because the poor people need it. But in fact, the Prophet ﷺ has also indicated to us that we should even eat from the Qurbani animal. So number three, skin can be kept for personal use. And number four, to give the rope, etc. of the animal as sadaqah. This is mustahab. Okay, so for example, you know the um, the string, or you can say the, um, what's it called now? So let's say, for example, if the animal had a saddle, for example, like a cow, or like a, like a cow, for example, or the rain, the rain of the animal, for instance, yes? The rain of the animal, you can give that to sadaqah, you can gift it to somebody, or you can use it, for, or you can retain it for personal use. So these are all permissible. What's not permissible? Sell the meat and skin. Note, if sold, it's wajib to give the amount as charity to the poor. Because remember, it's an ibadat, isn't it? Because it's an ibadat, you cannot use it for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for profitable reasons. Next, wage of butchers. You cannot use this to, uh, so the butcher, he cannot charge remuneration for that. So if you tell a butcher to sacrifice an animal for you, for example, you can give him money to purchase the animal for you. Yes, but you cannot pay him. He cannot charge you for his service of Qurbani. He cannot charge you for the service of Qurbani. So you can't say, okay, that you have to give me this extra way, extra amount for me to sacrifice the animal for you. You cannot do that. You can only give him the, Money to purchase the Qurbani animal for you. So wages of butcher. And likewise, meat distribution by estimation. Okay, note, it should be done by weight. So when you're distributing, then you distribute it by weight. Now, this is something, what I mean, what this means is that when you're distributing it, you can, you, um, a, um, you can distribute by estimation, for example. Now, this is only referred to uh, a large animal. This is referring to a large animal that where there are seven shares. There are seven shares, okay, right? So if you have seven people contributing into a large animal, let's say there's seven people contributing to a large animal, so now when it comes to dividing their shares, when it comes to now distributing, giving each one of their shares, then that has to be weight, and um, uh, that has to be done by weight. You cannot do it by estimation, okay? You cannot do it by estimation. Otherwise, what will happen is then that can impact another person's qurbani. So that's basically the general rules. Uh, of Qurbani. So let's go to the second section. We'll now go through some of the uh, frequently asked questions. Number one, question number one is, can Udhiha be performed on behalf of another person? Can Udhiha be performed on behalf of another person? For example, is it permissible to perform Udhiha on behalf of a minor or an unborn child? Yes, it is permissible. Now, there are a few things to mention here about performing Qurbani on behalf of somebody else, okay? And I think it's important that I do highlight this, that Qurbani animal, each person that who fills all the fulfills the conditions, fulfills the condition of Qurbani, they are now responsible individually to perform their own Qurbani. Yes? Those who do not fulfill the conditions, for example, minor children. Now, regarding my uh, regarding mature uh, the condition to be mature, this has been a subject of differences amongst the Hanafi Madhab. But the preferred view of the Hanafi Madhab is that Qurbani is not compulsory upon non balik children. Non balik children. Well, if a father, for example, if he was to perform qurbani on behalf of his minor uh, minor children, then the, or even unborn child, then there's no harm in that. It's permissible. It is not compulsory. However, if he performs qurbani on behalf of his mature children, for example, okay, mature children, and they fulfill the conditions of qurbani, or for example, a man uh, performs qurbani on behalf of his wife, yes. Performance of wife and she fulfills the conditions of Qurbani. Yes, 
So performing on behalf of somebody else, what's the ruling? So there are one or two scenarios. If, for example, if the qurbani was performed on their behalf with their consent, with their consent, or they are generally aware that their father or the husband will perform it on their behalf. So there's some kind of knowledge and there is consent, whether verbally or by implicit. If there's any form of consent or knowledge that the father is going to perform it on their behalf, then that the qurbani will be valid. The qurbani will be valid. However, if somebody was to perform the qurbani, if somebody was to perform qurbani on their behalf without their knowledge, without the consent, without the knowledge, without the consent, then that qurbani will not be wajib. Uh, that qurbani will not be valid. That qurbani will not be necessary. Why? Is because qurbani it is an ibadat. And just as people are responsible for their own ibadat, for example, zakat and so on, so you can't be zakat on behalf of somebody else without their knowledge. Okay, right? So it's the same thing here. That uh, it's the same thing here. That qurbani is an individual worship that's, um, uh, that, uh, that is compulsory upon those who fulfill the conditions. So they are responsible for it. So the wife is responsible for her qurbani. The balik children that who fulfill the condition, they are responsible for the qurbani. Yes? So if it was performed with their consent and they knew, then it is, uh, then it is, Valid. If it's without the consent, then it is not valid. Of course, what I mean by this, and I think there should be a clarity here, that the person themselves, that they purchase other animals or they purchase extra share for the children and for their, for the children and for, uh, and for his spouse, uh, for his wife. Okay, right? So he purchased it, purchased an extra share, purchased an extra animal, right? For his, uh, for his balik child or for his wife, for example. Okay, right? And that, that's what we're referring to. So with their consent, then it is yes. Of course, obviously they paid for it without the consent, without the knowledge, then that and then that will not be valid. And there's another masala here I would like to highlight is that if, for example, now this is we need to be very careful, that if for, the, for instance, for instance, a person um is contributing seven parts into a share, right? Seven parts into a share, okay, right? Let's say a person purchased two parts, two shares, two shares in a large animal, one for himself and the other one either for his wife. Or for his balik child. If he purchased it without their consent, without their knowledge of it whatsoever, then that qurbani will not be fulfilled on their behalf. When it's not fulfilled on their behalf, then that second part will not count towards qurbani. It'll count towards meat only. And when it counts towards meat, then that will potentially affect all of the seven shares, all the other remaining six shares of the qurbani which means then the qurbani for everybody else will not be valid. Yes? So if, for example, let's say, if there's seven shares, okay, right? Six people contributed to a share of qurbani. But one of them has got nothing to do with qurbani. It is only meat, for example. Then that will impact all of the remaining six people's shares. Then none of the qurbani will be valid. Because one of the conditions is that every part in the animal, maximum seven, it has to be with the intention of worship. Many people are not aware of this. So please remember this masala. Please understand this masala very carefully. Is that understood? So is it permissible? So I've already answered that question now for you. Number two, question two. Can a woman perform udhiya on her own or do she require a male guardian? The answer is yes. She can perform uh, She can perform udhiya on her behalf. She can sacrifice the animal by herself. Um, if she's not required, she's not, uh, she does not require a male guardian. Another common question, though, what if she's menstruating? Okay, what if she's menstruating? Then can she still sacrifice the uh, sacrifice the animal? Many scholars say that it is preferable that she doesn't. But even if she does, then the qurbani uh, qurbani will be fulfilled, and the animal will of course be halal. Number three, what is the ruling of performing qurbani out here on behalf of a deceased person? Can you do it for the sake of isar swab? The answer is yes. This has been a this has been a, a matter of controversy, but the majority position of the scholars is, of the of the Aima Arba, from the four method, is that Isali Swab in Ibadat is uh, permissible. Although with the Shafi method, there is a slight differences. But on the other hand, but however, for Qurbani animal, majority of the scholars, they say that it is permissible. And there are two hadith I can really, uh, I can uh, present to this. One is that of the hadith of Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu. And I think this is a hadith on Sunnah Abu Dawood, where Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu, every single year when he will perform Qurbani, uh, for himself, he would perform another qurbani on behalf of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And number two, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam once uh, on the day of Eid, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam sacrificed two two rams. The Prophet sacrificed two rams, and he sacrificed one, and then he made dua. He says, "Oh Allah, the first one is for myself, and the second one is for my ummah." 
The second one is for my ummah. It's for my family and for my ummah. All those who declare La ilaha illallah. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sent a share of reward of his Qurbani animal. Okay, the second animal that he sacrificed, he dedicated that for, he dedicated that for the entire ummah. He dedicated for the entire ummah, which means that any person, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that any person that who declares La ilaha illallah, dies in La ilaha illallah, they will receive a share of the reward uh, of that Qurbani animal, which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam dedicated for his ummah, inshallah. So yes, the answer is, it is permissible for Isa al sawab only. And again, um, the rules that we just discussed regarding um, doing it on behalf of somebody else, uh, that does not obviously apply here because you're not fulfilling the obligation on their behalf, or rather you're just sending them the reward. Question four. So can the financial equivalent of Udhiyah be given instead of a sacrificing animal? So this is what I was indicating earlier on. So for example, if a Muslim community are more in need of medicine, financial assistance, as opposed to meat, can the Udhiyah be skipped altogether and just equivalent sadaqa uh, money be given to them? The answer is no, you cannot do that because Qurbani itself, it is a wajib, it is an ibadat in of itself. Therefore, as per hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that um, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam indicated to this and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned this. He said that anyone that who uh, was able to sacrifice an animal where he did it, فَلَا يُقَرِّبَنَّ مُصَلَّانَ Then let him not come close to our musalla. Then let him, not, let him not come close to our Eid Salah. This is like a warning, like a threatening for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It doesn't mean that Eid Salah is dropped upon him. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam clearly mentioned that any person who is able to sacrifice an animal, they must sacrifice. So you cannot give any financial equivalence to Udhiyya. The only time you do that is that if you miss the Qurbani days, Qurbani was compulsory upon you and you did not perform it in any of the three days, now you'll have to give the equivalent of that Udhiyya into uh, charity, Sadaqah. Sadaqah, that becomes Wajib. Sadaqah, Wajiba now. So the same rules of Zakat apply now. So the same rules of Zakat apply. You have to give that into charity now. That's a Wajib to compensate for, uh, for missing your Qurbani. So the simple answer is, it is not permissible. You cannot, as per Hadith, and the only time you can only give the charity is that if you miss the uh, days of Qurbani. Question number five, is it permissible to perform Udhiya on behalf of a non-Muslim? The answer is no. Why? Is because one of the conditions is you have to be a Muslim. Yes, you have to be a Muslim. If you're not Muslim, then Ibadah doesn't apply to them. Another, another aspect to this question is that can you send the reward of Qurbani to a non-Muslim? The answer is no, because reward only applies to a uh, Muslim because uh, Islam is obviously a conditional for all of the legal implications and so on. Question six, can Udhiya be performed for personal intentions or specific prayers? Uh, perform pers personal intentions, um, it depends of the kind of intentions you're referring to. Usually, as a general rule, that the intention should be made specific for Qurbani. Anything that, any intention that opposes the intention of Qurbani Okay, opposes the intention of Qurbani or oppose it, um, opposes the intention of Qurbani, then that Qurbani will not be valid. It has to be specific for that Qurbani or any intention that indicates towards that. Question seven What is the role of intention niya in the validity of Udhiyya? So, what this means is why slaughtering is it necessary to verbally proclaim the intention and tasmiyah, or will intention and tasmiyah within the heart suffice? Now, the answer is this is simple is that intention is in the heart. Okay. Intention is in the heart, uh, so which means that you don't have to verbally pro profess the intention as long as the intention is in the heart in of itself, then that is uh, then that would suffice. However, the tasmiyah when you're saying a bismillah la akbar, that has to be mentioned verbally. So when you're sacrificing the tasmiyah, saying bismillah Allahu akbar, that has to be expressed verbally on the animal before uh, before slaughtering. But when it comes to intention, then making the intention in the heart is sufficient. Now, a question is that what if, if you're sacrificing on behalf of somebody else? Yes? Or if you're sacrificing on behalf of somebody else? So, for example, somebody's given you money. Somebody has given you money. And they've asked you to purchase this animal with this money and sacrifice it on my behalf. At the time of the sacrifice, is it necessary for you to make the intention of the uh, sorry, you have to make the intention obviously, but uh, is it necessary for you to mention the name of that person? The answer is it's not necessary. If you can, it is better. But if you do not mention the person's name, for so long as you made the intention that this is for Qurbani, then that is sufficient. Why is because the fact that you purchase the animal 
from that person's money, with, with that person's money, because you purchased the animal with that person's money, then that itself will be, be sufficient for that individual. Because, why? Is because when you purchase the animal uh, with that person's money, then that animal belongs to them, or that share in the animal belongs to them. So because it belongs to them, you are just an agent on their behalf. You're just fulfilling the command, or you're fulfilling the, you're fulfilling the command or fulfilling the instructions on their behalf. So you're like the agent. So you purchasing the uh, Qurbani animal or share the animal using their money, automatically that will be assumed that that animal belongs to them. And when you sacrifice the animal with the intention of Qurbani, even if you do not mention the person's name, then that Qurbani will be valid because that animal belongs to them or that share belongs to them. So I hope, um, I thought I mentioned that that will be clear. So in short, in summary, that the intention is, uh, intention does not need to be professed verbally, uh, verbally, it can be mentioned in the heart, that's fine. But when it comes to tasmiya, saying Bismillah Allah Akbar, that must be mentioned verbally. Number eight, that what should be done if a person is unable to find an eligible animal for udhiyah? Now, this is a bit of a difficult question. Uh, the answer what that person should do is that if they're not, then they need to try. They need to try and they must make an attempt to find that anim uh, uh, find an equivalent animal um, elsewhere, whether, they partic whether, whether locally or any other or at any other particular location. So you still must look for, uh, look for another alternative uh, to find the sacrificial animal. Number two, question nine, what is the ruling on performing udhiyah in countries where the practice is prohibited by law? So this is another difficult one. Uh, the only thing I can suggest, as I mentioned, uh, in this particular case, that you have to look for another alternative. Okay, you have to look for another alternative, look into another country elsewhere, that way you can um, uh, perform udhiyah and qurbani. If worst case scenario, if the worst case scenario is that if a person they've tried every single effort, and by the time, um, and and by then the days of qurbani have now have become um, uh, have expired. A person tried, but unfortunately they couldn't, and the days of qurbani already expired. Then, as I mentioned, they have to give the equivalent of that uh, in cash as sadaqa. Question ten: Can the meat from udhiya be given to, uh, given as charity to non-Muslim? Yes, it is permissible. You can give it, and there's actually a hadith that where. Uh, Sayyidina Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anhu, if I'm not mistaken, Sayyidina Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anhu, he would actually, um, he would sacrifice an animal and he will give some portion of the animal, okay, to his Jewish neighbor. He will give it to his Jewish neighbor. So giving so giving it as charity, it is, to non-Muslims, it is permissible. Okay. Um, okay, question 11. Is it permissible to perform udhiya using mechanical slaughtering method? Um, Mechanical slaughtering method, uh, if it's done an automotive, is it automated? If it's an automated machine, then that will be fulfilled. If it's automated, then it will not be fulfilled at all. Why? Is because one of the conditions is you have to say Bismillah, and but that's one condition. You have to say Bismillah, Allah put on the animal. And number two, that it is the person themselves, okay, that has to be uh, that has to physically sacrifice the animal, okay. That was in Arabic is called mubashrat. Mubashrat basically that's like physical contact. Okay, right? There has to be physical contact with the animal when you're sacrificing. Okay, right? So therefore, mechanical slaughtering will not suffice. Question 12. What is the ruling on performing udhiyah for someone who is financially incapable? So if someone who's financially incapable, if you do it on their behalf, so number one, it is not compulsory. Uh, it's not compulsory upon them to begin with because they don't fulfill the conditions. But if somebody does perform it on their behalf, then it is permissible. They will receive the reward, inshallah. Question 13. While collectively slaughtering a large animal, a cow, can the partners have varied intentions? Now, this is a this is an important question. I've alluded to this before. For example, that such as out of the seven par partners, four have the intention of qurbani, whereas the other, well, three have the intention of akika. Yes, it is. Now, just remember as a rule, if you have a large animal, it's the seven parts. Then the condition is that each person or each partner or each shareholder, you can say, right? Each shareholder, they have to have the intention of an uh, of ibadat, intention of ibadat. And this could be a three, one of three. Either number one is qurbani, number two is aqiqa, or number three is damit tamatto. So the qurbani that's compulsory upon someone who's doing hajj of tamatto or hajj of tiran. Yes, because Qurban is compulsory upon them in the Quran and Tamat Torah, okay? So any of these three intentions in the animal, then it is permissible. Then it is permissible. If it is ni neither of the intentions of Ibadat, if it's neither intention of worship. So for example, that if six members, 
right? If there's seven members, six members make the intention of uh, Qurbani or Akika, either of them two. And one only makes the intention of the meat, that I'm not doing it for Ibadah, but I just want the meat, then none of the Qurbani is going to be valid. So, which is why I mentioned earlier on the importance of when you're doing Qurbani on behalf of somebody else, okay, that who are responsible for their own Qurbani, they fulfill the conditions, you have to have the consent. If you don't have the consent, then the Qurban is not fulfilled. When the Qurban is not fulfilled, that will just become meat. Yes? And question 14, if one of the seven partners in a large animal gets deceased, okay, what is the ruling regarding his share? Then if that's the case, that so long as his, um, so, so long as he's already paid for it, for example, so as long as he's already paid for his share, for instance, okay, right? And now all of a sudden he's passed away, then his share could be distributed to the poor people. Question 15. If a person purchased a large animal with the question with, with the intention of Qurbani and later wants to include other people as well, is that permissible or not? Now, the thing is, the truth is that once you've already purchased a large animal for oneself, if he now wants to include other people, if he now wants to include people in um, uh, in that large animal, for example, now if he purchased the whole animal, if he purchased the whole animal for himself, if he purchased the whole animal for himself, now that and with his own money. Now that becomes his ownership. Now when it becomes his ownership, other people's qurbani, uh, including other people now for the intention of qurbani, okay, um, not for Isa al -Swab, obviously, intention will not be valid now. It will not be valid. Why? Is because one of the conditions is that, because one of the conditions is that uh, when other people want to be included in there, they have to also have an ownership in that animal. They have to have an ownership in that animal. Now because they do not have ownership in that animal, Right, because it was purchased from his money, for example, right? It was purchased from his money, and so therefore that's his ownership. Therefore, he could not include them. He could not include other people in that particular share. However, if he includes them with the intention of Isa al Sawab, sending rewards to them, then that is permissible. Okay, then that is permissible because he's not fulfilling the ibad uh, ibad on their behalf. He's just sending the reward. All right. So I hope that answers the question. And then question sixteen. Uh, this is the last and final question. If the Qurbani animal is slaughtered in a country that performs Eid Salah before you, then will your Qurbani be valid? So this is the last and final question. I've already alluded to this in the beginning. That The principle is that it is the Qurbani animal's location that is, taken to consider, that is considered, not the person themselves. So in this case, if the person has not performed it, Eid Salah yet. Recall the hadith I mentioned where the Prophet ﷺ said that whosoever was to perform Qurbani before the Eid Salah, then he must repeat the Qurbani. But what did the what did the Prophet mean by this? So the Fuqahas have mentioned, the Fuqahas have deduced from this, that it is not the person's location that's taken into consideration, but it's the Qurbani animal's location that's taken into consideration. So in other words, whichever region that the Qurbani animal is being slaughtered, right, as long as the people there have performed the Eid Salah, then it is then that Qurbani animal will be, then that Qurbani will be valid, even if the person who sent the animal in a different, uh, who is in residing in a different location, has not performed his Eid Salah yet. Okay, so in short, the answer is that it is the Qurbani animal's location is taken into consideration, not the person themselves. So, so long as the people, the local people, they perform the Eid Salah and then they sacrifice the animal, then that is valid, even if the person has not performed his Eid Salah. Likewise, for example, likewise, for example, that if he sent his animal, uh, animal to be slaughtered, if he sent his animal to be um, slaughtered in a region that where Eid Salah is not performed, they don't fulfill the condition, then their Qurbani will begin after Fajr Salah, yes, after Fajr, after Subha Sadiq, after the Fajr Salah. So even then, in that case, his uh, his Qurbani will be fulfilled, it will be valid, inshallah. Um, okay, so I hope that answers the question. Now, I believe that there are so many uh, questions here. Uh, I will now take your, I will answer your questions, inshallah. And um, we'll take you from there. Okay. Um, let me just go through each of these questions. We'll start a quick question. Um, what if you don't do Qurbani due to wealth? Okay. So if somebody's asked a question that, uh, what, uh, that what do you do that if you don't do Qurbani due to wealth? So just to, I think, um, let me just clarify that a bit more. If you mean that if you already possess the Nisab, you fulfill the conditions. But you did not but you did not perform the Qurban during those three days, then as I mentioned, that now you will have to give the equivalent of that uh, equivalent of that Udhi animal in money 
into charity now. You have to give it to charity, asadqa, that becomes wajib for you. Another question uh, will be answered after. Um, okay, so a big animal. Yes, so, uh, so someone's asked the question that what's the maximum shares? It could be up to seven. It could be, you can you do less than that? Yes, you can. You can do six, five, four, uh, three or two. So just as a, so just to re remind that this is a large animal. You can have maximum seven shares. You can have less than that, maximum se seven shares. Cow, it's a cow, buffalo, ox, or a bull, or a camel. Is it permissible to give the skin to the masjid who are collecting in our village with the intention of sadaqah? Yes, you can. You can even give it as a gift. Okay, you can even give it as a gift if you want. Okay, you can even gift it to somebody. You can even gift it to your friend, for example. That's permissible. You cannot profit from it. That, that, that's all. You cannot sell it. That's all what it is. Is it good? And is it okay to give kurban on behalf of deceased? Yes, I've already answered that. Um, and can somebody mention Sheikh's answer to this third question, kurbani on behalf of the deceased? Yes, it is. I've just mentioned that it is permissible. You can use, uh, you can um, perform kurbani on behalf of uh, a deceased person. And I gave the example of Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu, who would perform kurbani every single year on behalf of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And like as Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam once, he sacrificed two animals, one for himself and the other one for the ummah. So I think um, that's about it. If anybody has any questions, please uh, insert them into the chat box. Otherwise, we'll just conclude with the session. Okay, um, okay, let's see now. Okay, there's another question. Uh, if someone is living with their parents, how would one uh, assess basic needs? And if in access, if I haven't reached the Nisab? Basic needs, uh, just to understand, you know, how I do asliya. The basic needs are those that which are part of your daily essentials. Without that, it be things uh, things will become difficult. Okay, life will become difficult. For example, a gas cooker. Let's take example of a gas cooker. If you don't have a gas cooker, you can't cook food, so it becomes difficult. Let's say, for example, you have a laptop. Let's say, for example, you have a computer laptop. But let's say you're working from home, and you need a laptop because that's part of your income. If not, then you're going to struggle. For example, yes. So anything that which your basic necessity depends on, right? Your basic living, your basic living depends on. Then uh, without that you go to extra, uh, go to uh, you go through you will undergo some constraint, and that's relative to each individual circumstances. That's considered basic needs. That is excluded, so you don't include that at all. Okay, right? So if in access uh, surplus in that, then it is permissible. Okay. So I gave the if you can recall, I gave the example of a car. Okay, so you have let's say you have two cars. One is spare, uh, one is spare just for additional driving, and the other one is your need and necessity. Okay, so one car will be need, the other one's spare. Then um, Obviously, that would be considered you've got an additional asset, otherwise not. Uh, would you mind sharing? Um, okay. Mm. Now, a lot of charities organizations abroad collect Qurbani money. How uh, can we be sure the requirements met exactly, e.g. timing of sacrifice made at the first day of Eid of the animal requirement with age and charities themselves may not know the details? Okay, that's a very good question. This is the reason why. So this is the question about uh, trusting charity organizations. How can you know that whether they'll fulfill it? My simple answer to that, my, my response to that is simple, is that you need to do your homework first. You need to do your homework. How do you know that? Number one is, is number one, is that do they have like a reputation? How long have we, these charity organizations have been, have been around? Okay, have they been there for about 10 years, 15 years and so on? That's number one. Number two uh, is that, are they being trust, do they have ulamas or scholars? Do they have uh, trustworthy ulamas or scholars as part of the organization who are fulfilling this responsibility? If they don't, or number three, have they been endorsed by scholars? Have they been endorsed by scholars uh, um, uh, that they perform it in the right way? If that's the case, then you could just trust them. And if they do not fulfill any of these conditions, then I would be very uh, careful. So my advice would be is, and this is what I generally do on my family, is that we only stick to one particular charity who we have trust and we know that uh, there are many ulamas and scholars who are uh, who are part of this charity organization. Okay. Um, next is, my butcher told me he charged me X amount for the Qurbani. What should I tell him now? Okay, now um, charging. Now there, there's two things here, okay, right? As I mentioned, that one is they're charging you for the animal. One is charging for the animal. 
let's say you go to your local butchers and you say, look, I would like to do Qurbani the animal. He says, okay, it's going to cost you this much. If he's charging you for the animal, then it's okay. Then there's nothing wrong with that. What is prohibited is the butcher to charge you an extra amount as a service for sacrificing the animal. So let's say, for example, the typical scenario, let's say there's a butcher. He say, he does Qurbani for people. So let's say the animal, let's say, costs about 50 pounds. So he says the animal costs 50 pounds, but I'm going to charge you extra 20 pounds for me sacrificing the animal. Now, the extra 20 pounds will not be permissible. Yes. So if he says he charge you X amount for the Qurbani animal, if that is basically the animal in of itself, then there's nothing wrong with that. It's like you're paying somebody to purchase the animal because you have to purchase the animal, don't you, for it to be sacrificed. So that's why. So that's OK. Right. Uh, next is what if a father gave Qurbani without adult child's knowledge for a number of years? And then child later found out, is that okay with it? Again, so this is a very common question, and this is this is a common problem that people people don't realize. You have to understand is that an adult child, if he's baligh and he fulfills the conditions, he is now responsible. If he did not know about it at all without his knowledge, then his qurban is not going to be fulfilled. His qurban is not going to be fulfilled. It's like, for example, you've been giving zakat on behalf of somebody, right, without their knowledge at all whatsoever then uh, their zakat will not be fulfilled. So it's the same thing here. My mufti says it is not permissible to pay the butcher with the meat, but one can pay with money. Is that correct opinion or not? I'm not sure, but I think I've already clarified that. Uh, is it permissible to give the skin to the masjid? Yeah, I've already answered that. Yes, you can. It's permissible. You can even gift it as well. You mentioned that one can one cannot give the equivalent amount of sadaqa in place of a qurbani. Uh, however, can one send money for someone else to perform the actual qurbani? For instance, purchasing a share from an organization such as Islamic Relief for qurbani, which will be then distribute, distribute the meat to another country, for instance. Yes, you can. The, the, the simple rule is that when you're sending money, when you're sending money, right, to another country through a charity organization, for example, Islamic Relief, for instance, right, and they are now going to purchase the animal, qurbani animal with that. And then they distribute it to the poor people, then it is permissible. Then it is permissible. The condition is as long as they are purchasing the Qurbani animal, and then after after sacrificing the Qurbani animal, they will not distribute the meat to another country, for example, or to the local poor people. That is completely fine. That is permissible. Okay, Qurbani on the 13th, is it permissible or not? No. Qurbani animal, Qurbani days are only between 10, 11, and 12. The 13th, however, those are Ayyam al -tashriq. That's where you do the Takbirats. Okay, so please don't get confused with Tashriq. Tashriq and uh, the days of Tashriq, which is the Takbir and Qurbani days, okay? Tashriq is up until from the 9th to the 13th. Qurbani is from the 10th to the 12th. I sent Qurbani abroad rather than do it in the UK. Is it okay? Yes, it's permissible. Um, if the wife can afford the Qurbani, and her husband sacrifice her qurbani, is it compulsory on the wife to do her qurbani as well? Yes, it is. She has to do her qurbani if she's able to do so. Um, or what she can do, she can give the money to her husband who can then purchase two, um, two shares or two animals, one for himself, one for his wife, and that is permissible from her money, obviously. So in the case where the child didn't know was being paid on behalf was barley, uh, would one have to pay extra qurbani for multiple animals? No, what they need to do now is they need to give all that into charity. Okay, they have to give that into charity. So basically, wherever the animals, uh, value of the animals at that time, estimate the value, even maybe a share, even maybe a share, for example, maybe about 15 pounds or 20 pounds, for example, just give that into uh, charity. So I think that's about it, really. I've um, I've answered everybody's questions. So jazakum Allahu khair for your participation. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, accept our qurbani. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, enable us to, uh, to capitalize uh, on, these on these remaining days. Jazakumullahu khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.